Hey, I'm Tad, the associate pastor here at Wilkesboro Baptist Church, and thank you for joining us for this recorded service online. If you would like more information about our service times where you could come join us in person, you can see those at wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us at info at wilkesborobaptist.org. We hope that you enjoy it. God bless. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you on this uh, beautiful Lord's Day at Wilkesboro Baptist Church. We're glad that you're here. If you're a guest with us, I want to issue you a special welcome and thankful that you are here worshiping with us on this day. We would love for you to take the tear tab that's in your worship guide and put your contact information on it uh, and drop it in the offering box or hand it to me as you leave. I'd love to follow up on how your visit went with us today. If you're a church member or a regular attender, that tear tab is also a good way for you to communicate with us things that are going on in your life that maybe we need to pray, or pray about or be aware of. Feel free to take that tear tab and use that for that purpose as well. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 45. It reads this, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of righteousness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness. May God anoint us with his oil of gladness. May we put a smile on our face and have a song in our hearts and worship our Savior, for he is worthy. All God's people said...
we invite you to stand with us now as we sing, I Stand Amazed in the Presence. May you stand. Let's sing. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner the dead of me. For me it was in the garden. Let's sing it. For me. He's going to lead us off with this song. You know it is. I love you, Lord.
our testimony of love for the Lord is based on His love for us. I appreciate, Dr. Mike, how you organized those songs to remind us of God's love for us and then have us an opportunity to testify of that to our Lord. I am not uh, uh, Steve Robinson. He is the elder that was to lead in our confession and prayer time. Steve's actually in uh, the hospital right now. He had a minor heart attack. He's waiting on being transferred to uh, Winston-Salem to the hospital there. Pray for him and pray for Ethel as uh, they're waiting that, that transition and whatever the next step is for him. I'm going to ask if you would to turn your attention to our worship guide or the screen in front of you. Our memory verse for this month comes from Matthew 16, verse 24. Uh, it is a text of scripture we'll look at in a few weeks. Um, and it is Jesus' invitation to follow him. If you would, read along with me. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. As we pray in just a moment, we're going to pray for the Salt and Light Sunday School class, taught by Jeff Mitchell and James Sullivan. They meet at 8.30 in Classroom 113. Our prayer partner, uh, as far as a mission partner locally, is the Wilkes Prison Ministry. Uh, Chaplain Larry Ford is a member here at our church, and uh, this past Wednesday night in a testimony service, he shared a little bit about his journey, not only how he came to faith in Christ, but uh, the, the way that God has used him and the things he's experienced to minister to those who are in the prison. And so I want to pray for Chaplain Ford and pray for the prison ministry. And then the Unreached People group that we're lifting up to the Lord today are the Sunda people of Indonesia, a majority Muslim uh, people group with a false worldview that needs to know Christ. So join with me in a time of prayer. Our Father, we come to you this morning and we come to you recognizing that you are indeed great and glorious. You are worthy of our praise and our songs and our joy and our adoration. And we should be amazed at the greatness of your love for us, the depth of your kindness and mercy to show us love undeserved. Our Lord, as you have heard us testify of our love back to you and our praise, we acknowledge, Lord, that you care for us uh, and that you care for those in our church family. There are many in our church family sitting in our congregation today and our other services and many sitting at home uh, through situations of health, uh, uh, limitations and difficulties. Lord, we know you love us. We know you love them. We pray your help and your healing on them. We pray for Steve and Ethel especially as they are in the hospital awaiting uh, transition to, to Winston-Salem. We pray that you would direct their steps and help him to be able to get the treatment and the, the course uh, of action that he needs. Lord, we want to pray for Jeff and for James and the Salt and Light class as they gather each week to study your word. Bless them in the study of scripture. Bless that group as they try to put your word into practice in their lives. Lord, for Chaplain Ford and for the Wilkes Prison Ministry, the many in our church family who have participated in that ministry uh, through, uh, through way of giving or through way of serving or through way of being on the board, we thank you for them and we pray, Lord, that you would um, help that ministry as they communicate the gospel of Jesus to those who are imprisoned. Our Lord, we pray that you'd raise up missionaries and witnesses to go to the Sunda people who are holding on to a false worldview and ideology and bring them to a uh, life-changing experience with a living Savior. God, we come to you in this time in our worship service and acknowledge our failings and our shortfalls. We're going to see in just a few minutes from your word how you are the Lord who invites us to follow you. And all too often in our own lives, we come up with excuses or reasons or conditions for not following you. Things in our lives that we put more allegiance in or put more value in than we do in a relationship with Christ. And Father, whatever that is in the hearts and lives of those in this gathering, I pray that you would convict us of anything that is in front of our relationship with you. I pray that you would bring us to a place of surrender and submission to you. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would have our hearts, our eyes, our lives, our feet, and our hands, all of us, to follow you as we ought to. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege to gather and worship. We know you love us. And we are grateful for the privilege to express that back to you this day. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. 
As the praise singers come up to the platform, I'm going to invite you to stand with us as we sing Redeemed by the Blood of the Lamb. Shall we stand together? Sing. Now I have the living water from the well that won't run dry. All the pains of life have been satisfied by the precious blood of Christ. The same, I am changed, redeemed by the blood. sing now oh, the blood of Jesus Easter doesn't end on Easter Sunday we need to remember that his blood saved us for eternity so important at least it will lead us off on this
take your copy of scripture and turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 8. I love how the gospel of Matthew is constructed and organized. One of my favorite parts of it is how Matthew uh, takes a, a, a section of scripture as a, a section of Jesus teaching like in the Sermon on the Mount and then he follows it with a section of scripture that's a narrative section that describes his actions. So you've got the ministry of his word and the ministry of his works that are back and forth. See that also in chapter 10 where Jesus is instructing his disciples as they're to go on mission. And then chapters 11 and 12, they go out on mission and they're, in, they're ministering to uh, the people of Israel. Chapter 13, Jesus gives the parables, which is another section of teaching. And then follows that up with a section on his ministry and his works. And Matthew does that intentionally because he wants us to understand that Jesus isn't just Lord and Savior and King by what he says, but also by what he does. But not also by what he does, but also by what he says. And he keeps uh, going back and forth in that pattern to help us grasp the important truth of what he's trying to, to lay out for us in Scripture. That, that's shown in chapters 8 and 9. Jesus is, is declared in chapters 8 and 9 as one who has authority. Look with me, if you will, at chapter 7, Matthew 7, the last couple of verses there after the Sermon on the Mount. What you have is, is uh, the, the crowds hearing Jesus' teaching in verse 28. When Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority, not as their scribes. So the crowds noticed that Jesus was one teaching differently than everybody else who taught. And then in chapters 8 and 9, what Matthew does is he affirms the authority that Jesus has in his words by showing his authority in his works. And we're not going to see all the examples in chapters 8 and 9, but essentially what Matthew is saying is Jesus is king, and he's king by what he does. He's showing us that he has the authority to announce the kingdom and teach the kingdom and declare what it means to follow him. Indeed, one of Matthew's primary themes is the theme of the invitation to follow him. Jesus invited the disciples to follow him in chapter 4. He preached on what it means to be a citizen of his kingdom, which is essentially what does the person who followed Jesus look like in the Sermon on the Mount. He invites followers to follow him or speaks about following him here in chapter 8 and chapter 16. He invites specifically our memory verse, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 
And then indeed in the Great Commission text, we're told who are followers of Jesus to go out and make followers of Jesus. In other words, one of Matthew's themes, obviously the theme of the kingdom, which we're preaching on, but that theme of Jesus being the king that invites people to follow him, to turn from their past and turn from other things and turn their allegiance completely and totally to Jesus. Why, why does Matthew emphasize this so much? Because, folks, the reality is so many of us as Christians, we like a Jesus who rescues our souls, but we're not sure we want Jesus to do much else. If Jesus cleanses us of our sin and we know we're going to heaven when we die, we're good with that. that that's kind of where so many people in contemporary American evangelicalism want their Christianity to stop. N.T. Wright made this observation in his book, Simply Jesus. He says, we want a religious leader, not a king. We want someone to save our souls, not rule our world. Or if we want a king, someone to take charge of our world, what we want is someone to implement the policies we already embrace, just as Jesus' contemporaries did. What I'm here to tell you, folks, is the Jesus we find in Scripture does not invite us to follow him on our own conditions. He invites us to follow him unconditionally, without question or qualification, and invites us to surrender him. In fact, he demands that we surrender to him. Let me show you what I mean. In Matthew 8, Jesus talks with a couple of people who say they're willing to follow him. Verse 18, when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up and said to him, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Follow me, and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Where's the context? The context is in a section of Scripture where Matthew is showing Jesus has authority. We're going to see that in a couple of the different paragraphs and stories of chapter 8. So Jesus had healed and he had ministered and he had taught and there were these crowds that were around him and there were a couple of, of, of potential followers that came up to him and said, I'll follow you. And they had some qualifications. We'll talk about those in a minute. And Jesus made it very clear that what he was inviting, he was inviting people to follow him. The word follow me, the word follow is a verb. It's in the imperative form. It means that it's a command. Jesus is saying, follow me. Set everything aside and come after me. It's also in the present tense. It means that there's no end point to the action. Following me or following Jesus means that we're to follow him with every single part of who we are. Every day, every moment, every thought, every desire. And sometimes we, we get in our minds, well, what does Jesus mean by follow me? What's, what's he getting at? He was a first century rabbi. He invited people to, to leave their stuff behind and literally journey with him through life. The invitation to follow Jesus would, would have indicated that, that people were to leave their things and be with Jesus. Being with Jesus is a clear indication of what it means to follow him. In, in a wonderful little book that I would encourage to any of you, it's in the notes in your worship guide. John Mark Comer, Practicing the Way, talks about what it means to follow Jesus as a teacher and Lord and rabbi. It means to be with Jesus, it means to become like Jesus, and it means to do what Jesus did. So literally what Jesus is saying, he's asking those men, he's saying of them, walk away from the things you're holding on to and come journey with me. He was getting on a boat to cross over Galilee. Following Jesus meant getting on the boat to cross over Galilee with Jesus. It meant going on the journeys with Jesus. It meant setting aside things in your life so that you could be with Jesus. Now, obviously, Jesus is not literally taking up followers in a, in a physical, geographical sense in Wilkesboro, North Carolina. But he is inviting us to follow him by spending time with him, by being around him, by becoming like him, by setting aside anything in our lives that is a distraction from who Jesus is. The imperative for all of us today, every single person, is that Jesus is inviting us to follow him. Our primary obligation, if you don't hear anything else in my sermon today, our primary obligation is that you and I are to follow Jesus, who has all the authority. He's the king. He's the Lord of our lives. But we come up with excuses. In the text, there are two excuses given by two different individuals. 
Two excuses for following Jesus. The first guy is very enthusiastic. He walks up to Jesus and he says, I will follow you wherever you go. That sounds like uh, music to our ears in our contemporary culture, doesn't it? Uh, If you pay attention at all or have social media, you like the fact when you have some other friend that requests a friendship on Facebook or more followers on Twitter or more likes or hearts or whatever it is on Instagram. We like it when people come alongside us. And and boy, if, if a person came up to a politician and said, I'll follow you wherever you go, that politician would have a card for them to sign, would have some kind of donation form for them to fill out. They would be all up on that particular person saying, I will follow you wherever you go because we're in a world where we want people to follow us. We want people to like what we like and do what we do. But Jesus knows the hearts and minds of people. And he threw a dose of cold water on this man's enthusiasm. This young man said, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said this to him. Well, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man does not have anywhere to lay his head. The text doesn't tell us explicitly that this man decided not to follow Jesus, but the implication is that he didn't follow Jesus. Why? What kept this man from following Jesus? One excuse that keeps us from following Jesus is our comforts. Our comforts can keep us from following Jesus. See, that particular young man, I think he had watched some of the things happen. Maybe he was in the crowds when Jesus taught the Sermon on the Mount. Maybe he watched some of the healing episodes we're going to read about. Maybe he saw some of those things. He wanted to be a part of the movement. He liked the idea of being a part of where everybody else was. There were people there. There were disciples there. There were followers there. There were crowds there. And sometimes people just kind of show up for a crowd. They like the fact that there's a crowd there and they want to be a part of it. And so he walked up to Jesus and said, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of that movement. But in his mind, he wasn't counting the cost of what he would have to leave behind. He didn't understand exactly who it was that he was following either. When Jesus said the Son of Man, he's making a messianic reference. That, that Son of Man reference sounds very humble when we read it in our in our Uh, you know, 2,000 year ears removed from the events of Jesus' day. But Jesus is claiming to be the Messiah figure in Daniel chapter 7. It's a claim to kingship. It's a claim to authority when Jesus says the Son of Man doesn't have a place to lay his head. And it's an odd claim given that particular statement because if, if you think about it, there's a crowd, there's a following, there's a Messiah figure, there's someone who maybe is going to be the person who overthrows Rome. And this young guy wants to be a part of that. But when Jesus says, the Son of Man doesn't have a place to lay his head, essentially what he's saying is, I don't have things in this world. This world's stuff is not my hope or my dream. Your comfort and your luxury is not my dream. And my comfort and my luxury is not my dream. So what he's saying to this young man is, listen, if you come follow me, you're going to have to leave some things behind. You may not have a house that you live in. You may not have a a place that you can go and call your home. You may be giving all of that up to follow me, and I don't have any of that. I'm not living for this world is what Jesus is saying. Let me tell you something. There are a lot of people, a lot of people who claim to be Christians, who have had some kind of religious experience, who are not truly following Jesus because they don't want to give up their comforts. Because they don't want to give up their money or their phones or the things that they, that they give their time and energy to above and beyond Jesus. What Jesus is saying is if there is anything in our life that we hold more dear to ourselves and our practice and our efforts and our time than Him, then it is something that's keeping us from following Jesus. Our comforts can keep us from following Jesus. The second excuse in the text is the next person that shows up. He says, uh, Lord, I'll follow you, but let me go bury my father first. And then Jesus says something quite drastic. He said, let the bur- dead bury their dead. You come follow me. It's like, hold on a, se- hold on a second. What's Jesus talking about here? It sounds as if he's, 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 uh, he's telling this guy that he doesn't have any responsibilities at home and, and that he doesn't need to go to his father's funeral. That's not at all what's going on. If this young man's father had died, he would not be in the crowd following Jesus. He would have been at home preparing for the funeral. The issue was not that his father had died and he was neglecting the funeral preparations at home. The issue was, in all likelihood, that this particular young man was waiting on his father to die. 
Maybe he was getting up in years. Maybe he was waiting on that to happen. It, it, it could have been that he was waiting on an inheritance to take place. It could have been that he felt like he had obligations at home that, that, that superseded his obligations to Jesus. And Jesus, again, remember, he knows the hearts and minds of people. He knows every person that came up to him, just like he knows you and me. He knows what's in your way of following Jesus, just like or following him, just like he knew what was in the way of these particular men that was following him. And I think in this instance, our burdens can keep us from following following Jesus. This young man had an allegiance to something that was prior to Jesus. Jesus is not telling us that we don't have obligations to, to moms and dads and family members to care for. He's not telling us that at all. That is not a limitation on us following Jesus unless the things we do to care for someone else or the things we do to take care of our own needs essentially get in the way of us following Christ. Here's the bottom line of what happened in both of these instances. These two men would follow Jesus on their own conditions. Lord, I'll follow you when my dad dies and I get the inheritance and all that's settled. When that's done, I'll come follow you. The other guy was, I'll follow you wherever you go. But I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure I don't want a place to sleep. I'd, I'd like a place to sleep, so I'm not going to follow you until that part of, of the future is settled. Here's the problem. Whenever we try to set the condition for following Jesus, we're not really following Jesus. Jesus invites, rather demands, that following him is unconditional. He's the only one that sets the condition that sets the reality for what following him looks like. And if there's anything in your life, anything in my life, where we say to God, God, I will follow you. I will do whatever you tell me to do. As long as you don't make me give up that. As long as I don't have to leave that behind. As long as I get to keep this. If we do anything like that, we're not really following Jesus. Because our allegiance is to something else, something more, something different, something that is not Christ. Jesus has every right to say to us, I'm in charge, following me means you need to be willing to give up whatever. Now, he may not take everything. Following him doesn't mean you can't have a house, and doesn't mean you can't have a retirement account, and doesn't mean you can't have a measure of comfort. That's not at all what Jesus is saying in the text. What he's saying is, if those things are more important than him, we're not really following him. Jesus. He should be able to have the right, he does have the right to say to us about anything, this is not off the table. Following me means you might have to lay this aside. And you say, Pastor, I get that. I understand that. I'm willing for Jesus to be able to do that. But do you realize all the things I've got going on in my life? Do you know my burdens? Do you know my situations? Do you know my circumstances? Do you know my challenges? Do you know my frustrations? Do you know the things I deal with day in and day out? And for some of you, I know some of those things. You've talked to me about them. For most of you, I don't know. I don't know what goes on in your heart and mind day by day, moment by moment. I know what goes on in my heart and mind. I know the way I wrestle with these, these very issues. I know the, the, the parts of my life that I'd really rather not give over to God. And he says, I need to give over to him. I know all those wrestlings and I, I know those tensions. And, and here's what I would say to you. What the text tells us about who Jesus is means that no matter what he asks of us, we should follow him. There are three reasons in three of these little narratives. There are several more reasons in chapters 8 and 9. We're not going to go through all of them. There are three reasons in chapter 8 that tell us why we should follow Jesus, why his demand on us is not too much. The first one's found in chapter one or chapter eight, verse one. When a leper came down, uh, or when he came down from the mountain, rather, great crowds followed him, and behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, "Lord, if you will, you can make me clean." Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, "I will be clean." Immediately, the leprosy was cleansed, and Jesus said to him, "See that." You say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. Here's reason number one why we should follow him. No matter what's going on in our lives, it's because our diseases don't disturb him. Some of you may be sitting here thinking, uh, you know, I, I don't know that God wants me because here's my struggle. I, I don't know that God wants this type of person. He can't possibly want me 
because of what I've been through and what I'm facing and what I'm walking through. Some of us think that. Some of us think God can't possibly want us. God can't possibly desire us because uh, we, we can't imagine getting that particular issue solved in our lives. But I want to remind you, our diseases don't disturb him. Notice what happened in the text. A leper came up to him. Leprosy was the, the sickness in the ancient world. It was the contagious illness. It was the thing that, that it, in fact, if you go back in the Old Testament, it, you're not going to find a whole lot of specific indications about specific sicknesses in the Old Testament law except leprosy. The leprosy one is long. I was actually reading my devotions this morning in the book of Leviticus, and, and I read the, the, one of the chapters on leprosy. And it's a long chapter, and it is a repetitive chapter. And why is it? Because leprosy was one of those diseases that was contagious. So there were all kind of stipulations for the leper. The leper, if they were diagnosed with leprosy, they had to remove themselves from the community, cover themselves, and whenever they got around in, in any proximity of anyone else, they had to yell out, unclean, unclean, because there was, a, there was a, a, an, an, an expectation that they not share their disease with somebody else. When you were a leper, you removed yourself from your family. You went to live in a leper colony. You lost the touch of loved ones, friends, and family members. You were isolated. You were set apart. I want you to watch what Jesus does. The leper came down to him and said, Lord, can you make me clean? And before Jesus healed him, he touched the leper. I mean, think about that. And as we know, Jesus is able to heal. And we see it from the 20th century lens looking back on it. It would have made a whole lot of sense for Jesus to say, you're clean, I pronounce you clean, and then give him a hug. That's not what Jesus did. In the shock, and it would have shocked and awed all of the guests and all of the surrounding people that were there. Jesus went up to the leper and in front of everybody touched the leper before he did anything else. Imagine that for just a second. That man may, probably had not had a hug from a family member for months or for years of his life. Nobody to hold his hand. Nobody to give him a kiss on the cheek as a way of welcome. He had missed human touch. We know what that's like. You've been in situations where you've missed human touch for a period of time. We all went through that. Some of us went through that with loved ones. During COVID, where there was isolation and separation and couldn't, couldn't be around folks. I mean, we remember what that's like. Jesus touched him first. And then he said, be clean. Here's why he does that. Because our diseases don't disturb him. I'm going to tell you something. There is not a thing going on in your life. Physical, spiritual, emotional, psychological, mental. There's not a thing going on in your life that so disturbs our Lord that he doesn't want you to be a part of his family. Our diseases, quite frankly, don't disturb him. He invites any of us and all of us to follow him. Let me tell you something else. You say, Pastor, I get that. I, I'm with you. If Jesus were here today and he were walking down the aisle at Wilkesboro Baptist Church and he could walk up to my situation and he could touch it and he could heal it, I would be right in line. I would follow him. I would give everything to him. But Jesus isn't here, physically anyway. He's not walking through the streets of Wilkesboro, North Carolina. Can, can I really follow him like he expects today? And, you know, can he really meet my situation when we're removed from his, you know, time and ministry in the world? Does he really still heal people? I mean, does that really happen? Does he really still step into situations and answer requests and do miracles? Is he able to do that kind of stuff? Because we're, what, 2,000 years removed from this story? And thousands of miles removed? And, and Jesus, where is he? He's in heaven next to the throne room of God. Well, let me just remind you, as if that question was on the front of the lips of, of others, look at what Matthew does next. Look at Matthew's very next story. When Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes, and another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. 
I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. Here's reason number two why we must follow Jesus. Our distance doesn't limit him. I love this story. This is one of my favorites in all of Scripture. A centurion showed up and said, uh, Lord, there, there's a servant that I love deeply, and he's ill. He needs your healing. Jesus said, I'll, I'll come heal him. And then the centurion, in an act of faith, probably an act of glorious respect, too, he was likely a Gentile. He knew that if inviting a Jew into his home would have meant that the Jew was unclean. Uh, and so he looked at Jesus and said, I'm not worthy to have you come in my home. I know you're a man, un, a man with authority because I understand authority. All you have to do is say the word my servant will be healed. What faith, right? Don't you wish you had that kind of faith? Well, that kind of faith is accessible to any of us. But here's what Jesus said. Your servant is healed across space and time. Jesus did not have to be physically present in the room to answer the prayer. Let me, let me ask you a question. Do you think the distance between Jesus and that centurion's house is any larger or greater or more problematic than the distance between where Jesus is now and where we are? Not at all. For a whole host of reasons. Number one... Everything under the sphere of the authority of King Jesus is within his touch. So if he has authority over everything, if he's king over everything, it doesn't matter whether we're 2,000 years removed from the stories and whether Jesus physically is present in heaven, he is able to intervene in any situation that you and I have. Our space or our distance from him is not a limitation to Jesus. On top of that, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is with us anyway. That the Spirit of Jesus came in with us as followers of Christ in this room. Jesus is present. And folks, I want to tell you something. Wherever you are and whatever's going on in your life is not so far removed from God that he can't speak to it and deal with it and address it. Our distance doesn't limit him. Let me give you a third story that tells us why we should follow Jesus. And it's the last one we're going to look at today. It found in verse, um, uh, verse 23. When Jesus got in the boat, his disciples followed him. They were making their way from one side of the Sea of Galilee to another. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. Let me say it this way. Our storms don't worry him. Our storms don't worry him. That's another reason we ought to follow Jesus. Notice that Jesus was asleep. Now, you can, you can probably imagine that he needed some rest. He had taught, uh, and, and when I preach, uh, it wears me out psychologically and spiritually and emotionally. It's one of those things where I give myself to the text and the study of it, and I long for people to come to know Christ, and I try to preach prayerfully and preach as, as uh, faithfully as I can, and I'm worn out after preaching. But after Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount... He taught and he healed and he ministered and he answered questions and he cared for people and he, he, he was investing his time and energy into folks. So you can imagine when he got on the boat, he was tired. He was exhausted. He slept. Uh, I saw a guy with a shirt that said, Jesus take, took naps. I, I think I'm going to buy that shirt. I have that. My kids buy that for me for Father's Day or something. Uh, let, me, let me speak about rest for just a second before we move on in this particular, uh, particular part, uh, point in the sermon. Dallas Willard observed that one of the greatest spiritual attainments is the capacity to do nothing. Thus the Christian philosopher Pascal remarked, I've discovered that of all the unhappiness of men arises from a single fact that they are unable to stay quietly in their own room. Willard observed, doing nothing has many other advantages. It may be a great blessing to others around us who often hardly have a chance while we are in action. And, and possibly the gentle Father in the heavens would draw near if we would just be quiet and rest a bit. Generally speaking, He will not compete for our attention. And as long as we are in charge, He is liable to keep a certain distance. 
Let me say something to you, folks. If Jesus needed rest, if Jesus needed time set aside for his relationship with the Father, if Jesus needed to take a nap and relax his body, we need the same thing. We, there are some moments in our lives where if we're really going to follow him and seek him and serve him, we've got to get quiet and get alone and rest our souls, rest our minds, rest our hearts spiritually. And I realize that looks different for all different of us. Some of you moms can't even imagine having a moment to think to yourself rather than having time to actually rest. And some of us are just busy. That's just the way we, we operate. We don't ever sit down until it's time for bed. But sometimes we just need to pause. Jesus rested. Why did he rest? How could he rest? Because our storms don't, don't worry him. The things we think are problems, they may feel like problems to you, but they're really not problems to God. And think about it in the, this context. So he was asleep in the middle of the boat. I, I could see sleeping in a boat, but a boat in the middle of a storm? It's not like this is a yacht where it had its own like, uh, place of rest down in a lower chamber. Jesus, uh, in Mark's account, was asleep on a cushion in the middle of the boat. And the disciples came to him. Look at this, verse 25. They went and woke him and say, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. Now, think about this for just a second. Not all of the disciples were fishermen, but several of them were. Peter, James, and John had been fishermen. Andrew was a fisherman. They had been on the sea before in storms. This is not new to them. I can't possibly imagine Peter, you know, always speaking Peter, letting anybody go wake the Lord if this was just a little rolling storm. Can't possibly imagine that at all. In fact, I can't possibly imagine Peter worrying about his life being over unless this was a storm, a really big storm. Lots of wind, lots of waves, lots of rain, and they went and woke the Lord. He's asleep in the middle of it. Think about that. How, how, how wonderful would it be to be able to sleep through some of the storms that we have? He's asleep in the middle of the storm. They wake him up and say, Lord, we're perishing. Don't you care that we're about to die? Listen to what Jesus says. I love this. He said to them, why are you afraid? You have little faith. <laughs> like, hold on a second, guys. You're worried about the wrong things. And I can, I can almost imagine them thinking if they didn't say it out loud. But hold on a second. The boat's turning this way and that way. The storm is about to drown us. We're about to go under. And then Jesus does something utterly astounding. He rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was great calm. And the men marveled, what sort of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Jesus is peace in the storm. The reason our storms don't disturb him is because our storms don't really affect him. They don't, they don't change who he is. They don't change his ability. And, and, and by the way, this is one of those moments, I think, in the disciples' lives where the identity of Jesus is really made known. It, it was not abnormal in Jewish history for people to be healed by a prophet. Elijah and Elisha had healed. Moses had done some different miracles in the Old Testament. That was not altogether disturbing to them. So when Jesus healed, they had him in their mind. This is a prophet. This is someone who they could trust. This is a special man. But the only times in the Old Testament, the only times where anything happened with nature, it was obvious that God did it. I mean, you've got the, the plagues on the, 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 the Egyptians. God brought those plagues down. I mean, it was obvious God was doing something unique in salvation history. When the people of Israel walk across the Red Sea on dry land, yeah, Moses was there, but everybody knew it was God that parted the Red Sea. So when Jesus spoke to the winds and waves and said, Stop, and everything stilled in that moment, <laughs> that got their attention. Who is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. Here's what that means. Folks, the one we're following can put a stop to any storm in your life in a moment's notice. And some of you have been asking for that. Some of you have been talking to God about your storms and you have been begging Him to change the storm. And He can. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind 
that if God wanted to, in your life and situation, He could give you peace to that situation. But He doesn't always do that. Because He's teaching us something that is tremendously important. Bran Hansen puts it this way. He said, Jesus was showing the disciples something that if we trust Him, will allow us to live in a wonderfully free way. Even if the ship goes down, we'll be safe. For with Him we're safe. Death itself is not the last word. The last word is joy. He, he, he then asks, but what if it's all going down for real? What if everything is falling apart? What if the country is falling to pieces? What if the evil people are winning? What if I lose everything? Shouldn't we be anxious then? Shouldn't we be anxious? I mean, the election's coming up and it looks like, oh my goodness, it's going to be the same folks as it was last time. And we're going to hear all kind of complaints and frustrations and anger and that side hates us and that side hates us. And I mean, we live in a world of chaos. And what if all the worst things happen? And if you want to know what those worst things might be, just watch the news later today. Because they're going to tell you all the terrible, uh, possible, catastrophic things that could take place in the world. What if everything's falling apart? Shouldn't we be anxious? Shouldn't we worry? No. Because if we're with Jesus, our storms don't worry Him. He's in charge. The kind of peace that we long for happens when we are in relationship with Jesus. And Jesus makes that invitation to every single one of us. This is what I love about Jesus. He, he doesn't just invite the best and the brightest. In the ancient Jewish world, if you wanted to be a, a rabbi, you had to follow a specific process to be a teacher. You had to line up underneath a rabbi, be a follower of a rabbi, and then eventually become a teacher. In, in Jewish culture, all the Jewish boys would be sent to school. Uh, they would be sent to school at the very start of their lives. Bet Sefer was the house of the book. It's where all little boys went. And by, from, from age 7 to age 12, they would spend those five years memorizing the Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Sounds fun, right, guys and girls? Memorize the entire first five books of the Bible. And then at, the, at age 12, almost all of the kids would be sent home to go learn at their mom and dad's trade or to work on the family farm. And the best and brightest would stay around from 12 to 17, and they would go to school at Bet Midrash, which is the house of learning. You know what they would do for those five years from 12 to 17? They would memorize the whole Old Testament. All of the Old Testament is what they would do. And at the end of that, that graduation, that 17-year-old graduation, most of the boys that had done all of that would then be told, hey... You know, thank you for learning, but your best bet in life is to go back home, have children, and pray that your children become a rabbi one day because you're not rabbi material. Only the best and the brightest, a very select few, would have a chance at 17 to apply to be the apprentice of a rabbi. And they would then, it's like what Paul did with Gamaliel, you know, where he went and studied under Gamaliel and became his rabbi. Only the best and the brightest were allowed to be a follower of a rabbi. But that's not who Jesus invited. He invited fishermen, and tax collectors, and zealots. And when he says in Matthew 16, if anyone would come after me, he means anyone. Jesus is not just inviting the best and the brightest to follow him. He's inviting any of us to follow him. Why? Because, folks, our storms don't worry him. And our distance doesn't limit him. And our disease don't disturb, do, do not disturb him. He is absolutely in charge. And he is saying to every one of us in this room, if we want the peace that he offers, we can put our trust in him and seek him and surrender to him. Some of us as Christians, that's exactly what we need to do. We've made too many excuses. We're holding too many things back. We have allegiances that are more important to us than our allegiance to Jesus. I'm going to tell you, Jesus is saying to us, trust me and follow me now. Some of you might be in the room today and you might be saying, okay, that sounds really nice, but I'm not really ready to trust my life to Jesus. I'm not ready to follow him. You might be a little bit like uh, Augustine before he was St. Augustine. He was a philosopher. He was a... 
um, well-read, well-communicated man in his, uh, in his 30s. Uh, he, was, he lived in the 4th century. Uh, he's known as Augustine of Hippo today. When he was in his 30s, he went and heard uh, Ambrose of Milan preach a sermon. And, and he testifies of this, Augustine does in his book, The Confessions. He said he heard that sermon, and, and he was living a life that wasn't really right. He had a mistress that, that, was, that was kind of his pleasure on the side. He had philosophies he was seeking after. But he heard that sermon, and he prayed this prayer after that sermon. He said, Lord, make me good, but not yet. Don't make me good yet. Let, let, me, let, me keep having, let me keep having fun for a little while longer. I'm thankful that God didn't leave Augustine alone, that he, that he kept going after him, that he kept seeking after him because Augustine became one of the most important and influential church fathers in Christian history in terms of what he wrote and his ministry. For some of you here today, that's been kind of your prayer. Lord, I, I, I'll, I'll come after you, but not yet. I want to do this thing or I want to do that thing or I want to live this way. I'm telling you, and I'm inviting you, and Jesus is inviting you, trust him and follow him today. Don't wait any longer. Don't delay any more. Put your faith and trust in Jesus for salvation today. Christian, is there anything in your life that's keeping you from truly following Jesus? You holding on to stuff that is not allowing you to follow Jesus faithfully? If you are, would you confess it? Turn your life over to Christ and follow Him completely. Stand with me if you will. Lord... What an invitation. What a demand to follow you. As I look into my own heart and life, and as I look out across our congregation, I'm well aware that too many times we let things that uh, are unimportant impede our life of following you. Forgive us for that. There are things we need to confess and repent of, Bring us to our knees in repentance and surrender. Lord, if there are one or several in the room today that are all at that point of following you with their life and entrusting themselves to the salvation you offer, I pray that today would be their day of repentance and faith. And they would experience the goodness and the life that you came to offer. Dear God, help us to follow you. Help us to know you're the King and you're the Lord and entrust ourselves to you completely. We pray this in Christ's name. We're glad to have you worship with us online today. If you'd like to learn more about following Jesus or you'd like more information about Wilkesboro Baptist Church, visit our website, wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us, info at Again, thank you for worshiping with us.